Welcome to the Electricity of Life, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. What is the role of electromagnetic fields in health and healing? Today, various electromagnetic therapies have gained unprecedented acceptance and use, and scientific studies continue to affirm the influence of electromagnetic fields on life. In Western medicine, the tradition is for various specialists to treat supposedly disconnected parts and organs. But the leading proponents of electromagnetic healing propose a new way of seeing the human body and all living organisms. One of the leading pioneers in this rapidly growing field has been Dr. Jerry Tennant, an ophthalmologist whose book series Healing is Voltage describes his groundbreaking research into the electrical circuitry of the human body. Today, in part one of this two-part presentation, Dr. Tennant begins by sharing his own remarkable challenges, which catalyzed his scientific journey. I always begin my discussions with the disclaimer that I'm not speaking with my Texas MD license. I'm speaking with my Arizona MDH license. Arizona and Nevada have special medical boards for integrative medicine and homeopathic medicine, and I'm licensed under that Arizona Board of Integrative and Homeopathic Medicine. And that's the license that I have this conversation under and not my Texas license. Well, I am trained as an ophthalmologist and did uh, traditional ophthalmology with a focus on uh, cataract surgery for 30 years or so. I had a lot of fun being an ophthalmologist. I was able to do a lot of things that uh, changed the way ophthalmology was practiced. I had a great deal to do with uh, bringing intraocular lenses uh, into this country or the use of them. When I was trained, uh, we would simply take the lens out of the eye and people would end up wearing really big and thick glasses. Of course, those allowed you to see, but they were fairly disabling because everything looked 30% too big and 30% too close and it was hard to walk or drive or whatever. So I was one of the early people to put lenses in eyes after cataract surgery. Uh, and then there were some problems with the European lenses that we used in the beginning. So I modified those and uh, got uh, lenses to work better and then began to teach others how to do that. So that was one of the fun things I did. When I was trained, we kept patients in the hospital for two weeks with both eyes blinded. And, and of course, uh, the elderly tend to uh, become disoriented and even psychotic if you keep them in bed and blind them for a couple of weeks. So I developed a way to make a watertight incision so that they didn't have to stay in bed and they, we could actually get them up and walk them immediately from the surgery table. And that changed uh, a lot of things as well. And also we had a problem with people, uh, the elderly going into the hospitals. You know, uh, elderly people have a tendency to get a particular pattern of living. They eat certain things that agree with them and that keep their uh, digestive and urinary processes working. Uh, there are foods that upset them. And so you put them in a hospital and change all of that. Uh, they commonly get sick just from being in, outside their normal environment and often fall and hurt themselves. One of the things we began then to work on was uh, outpatient surgery. So being able to operate on a uh, cataract and then uh, have people go immediately home uh, was a great benefit. And we helped, uh, along with my anesthesiologist and internist, develop the techniques for that and taught how to do that. And I guess uh, the next thing I did in ophthalmology that was kind of fun is I did the majority of the research for the laser that's used in LASIK surgery. So I did about 90% of that uh, research for the company called Visex. But during that process of doing the laser surgery, we didn't know that the laser wouldn't kill viruses. And so I was using the laser to carve the scar off of the cornea of a fellow from India that had uh, leukemia. And it carved the scar off uh, well enough, but it also released viruses from his cornea. And that went into my nose and into my brain, and I got encephalitis. And so I got to where I could see a patient know what was wrong with him, but I couldn't remember how to write a prescription. I also developed spastic movements, so I'd be sitting there, and all of a sudden I'd do something like that, which doesn't work really well if you're operating inside somebody's eyeball. And I had overwhelming fatigue. And so for all those reasons, I had to quit work at the end of November 1995. 
And so I uh, slept 16 hours a day, had two or three hours a day in which I could understand a newspaper and then like a light switch, it'd go off and I couldn't understand it anymore. I went to the best doctors I could find in Boston and New York, et cetera, et cetera. And they all said, well, you have three viruses in your brain. We don't know what to do about it. Good luck. So during that two or three hours a day, I could think I had to figure out how to get myself well. And so I began the journey of trying to figure out how I might do that. And one of the things that resonated with me was that every cell in the body had the same hardware even though cells look quite different, just like a laptop looks different than a desktop computer, they still have all the same basic parts. And I thought, well, if I can figure out how to make one cell work, I can make them all work. And so I started down that road and I bought a bunch of cellular biology books, which I hadn't read in 30 years and began to read through them. And one of the things that resonated with me, it said that cells have to run at a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. Well, I didn't really remember much about pH except it was acid-base balance. But as an eye surgeon, I didn't really need to know much about that for 30 years. And so I began to study pH and discovered that pH is simply the measurement of voltage in a liquid. If you think about a copper wire, you just put, turn the switch on and the electrons flow. You turn the switch off and they stop. But in a liquid, it can either be an electron donor or an electron stealer. And by convention... If the liquid is an electron stealer, you put a plus sign in front of the voltage. And if it's an electron donor, you put a minus sign in front of the voltage. By convention also, you uh, take the, um, the voltage and you convert it to a logarithmic scale from 0 to 14 and call it pH. So plus 400 millivolts of electron stealer is the same as a pH of 0. And minus 400 millivolts of electron donor is the same as a pH of 14. When you read then that cells have to run at a pH of 7.35 to 7.45, that's a synonym of minus 20 to minus 25 millivolts, give or take a millivolt. So I said, oh, cells have to have voltage to work. That makes sense. And so all of a sudden, this new way of thinking about things uh, was obvious to me. The next issue was, how do you measure it? Well, of course, if you take a standard pH meter, it has a switch on it. You can switch it from pH or millivolts, whichever one you want to, to have it read out. And you simply stick the probe in a liquid and it'll tell you what the pH is or convert or what the millivolts is and or convert it to the logarithmic scale of pH for you. So I said, well, how do you measure it in the body? And I found that a chap named Nakatani uh, was the first person to use modern electronics to measure acupuncture circuits and published in 1951. So I got his rather rudimentary equipment, started measuring, and where my brain should be running at minus 25 millivolts, I found it was running between minus 2 to minus 4 millivolts. So then I knew why it didn't work. It didn't have the juice to do it. So the next issue is, well, what am I going to do about it? So I began to do some more reading and found that a Russian chap had figured out the waveform that would more efficiently transfer electrons to cell membranes. I began to try to learn about that and discovered that there was a Russian pediatrician named Zulia Velieva Frost. Zulia Velieva married the chap from London named Frost and had moved to London. And she was in the process of teaching people how to use this Russian device to transfer energy to cells. So I called her and I said, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing. And she said, well, as luck would have it, I'm teaching my first seminar in San Francisco in three days. I said, sign me up. I'll be there. So I went to that seminar and got the Russian device and began to recharge my cells. And in about six weeks or so, things began to get better. The other thing that happened about that time was that I was on an airplane and there was a nurse sitting next to me from this Dallas area. And she began to tell me that she had uh, lymphoma, had this big tumor around her neck and scattered throughout her body, and that she had gone to Mexico. And in a matter of days, the tumors were gone, even though MD Anderson had told her to go home and die. So I went down to visit with the docs that helped her to see how in the world they did that. And that was sort of the beginning of my journey 
along with this other business of the electronics to figure out how to get well. And one of the things they taught me was that essentially all uh, tumors are associated with infection in your teeth, particularly root canal teeth. And so she had gone down and they had uh, pulled her root canal tooth and cleaned up the infection in her mouth. And in a matter of days, her tumors were gone. And she sent me not only photographs, but she sent me her medical records from MD Anderson of when she came back and they proved that her tumors were had disappeared. So I had a root canal tooth here in the what's called the spleen stomach acupuncture circuit. And so my docs here in Dallas said, there's nothing wrong with that tooth. But I'd also developed a bleeding disorder. And so I went back down to uh, Mexico and had the dentist that had operated on this nurse uh, work on me. And when she pulled that tooth, there was so much infection in the bone, it splattered all over her mask. And yet I had no symptoms as far as the tooth was concerned. But 48 hours after she pulled the tooth, my bleeding disorder was cured. And uh, that was rather amazing. And then over the next six weeks or so, my brain started to work again. And so that's how I started going down this road of, of figuring out how the body really works and what the role of voltage is in the body, because it's obviously so different than what I was taught in medical school. One of the things that I was led to, under, to try to understand was acupuncture. Actually, that was part of a bigger picture in that I was sitting in my chair at home and I said to myself, well, obviously, traditional medicine that I was taught told me go home and die. And so that obviously wasn't working so well. But that sometimes chiropractic works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes acupuncture works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes essential oils work, sometimes they doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. So there are all these various medical models that sometimes work and sometimes don't. So my thinking was, if I could figure out, there has to be a common denominator that goes through all of these. Otherwise, because, I mean, if things work, there's, it's because it's following some basic laws, some basic rules of how things are supposed to work. If I could figure out what that common denominator was running through all of these different paradigms, then I had no how to get myself well. And it began to become apparent to me that the voltage piece was the common denominator for all of these things. Now, obviously, it becomes very complicated uh, when you start, particularly someone like me who has no background in, in electronics or even in, in physics. I had, you know, a freshman college physics, and that was my background. The issue is how do you figure out what the common denominator is, and I began to go down a different road in that I began to, to understand that there's no such thing as a bunch of little balls of electrons spinning around a, a, a charged ball in the center. It's been known for probably 75 years or so that that's really not what an atom is, but that we still teach that. And so I began to read and talk to, I fortunately was able to talk to some various people who had gone down that road before me and began to understand more about what an atom is. Because if you don't understand what energy is, what an atom is, even how the universe works, you can't understand how a cell works. And so I began to consider that there were alternatives. So one of the things that was a great influence on me was the work of Schauberger in uh, the, the Swiss water specialist who had figured out how to uh, make a flying saucer that was fueled by water. And he was captured by Hitler, as you probably know, and made to, to make us, uh, you know, work in their, that uh, industry for the Germans. Um, he understood very, very well that there are things that spin right and concentrate into a point, concentrate the energy into a point, which of course we call implosion. And there's something that spins left that starts small and gets bigger and then disappears, we call an explosion. And that those are the two basic kinds of energy. Uh, Schauberger's work with water and energy was very influential on my road down trying to figure out how the body works. 
The other thing that was very powerful was to read the work that cells, I mean, that muscles are piezoelectric. And so I began to consider, and in a, and I was initially wrong, I thought our muscles were wired up the way a 12-volt battery is. You know, you take the cover off of a 12-volt battery and there are a bunch of one and a half-volt batteries all wired together in there. And I thought that's the way our body was wired up, that we had our muscles were just one big battery that provided power for the cells to work. But then I began to notice that there were patients that had normal total body voltage as I measured it, but there would be one circuit out or one organ out. And I said, well, then I have to be wrong about how we're wired up. And I began to consider that acupuncture meridians were stacks of muscle batteries wired together into one single column that provided power. And I was talking with with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Evans, about this, and he said, well, you, have you read Tom Myers's book, Anatomy Trains? And I said, no, I never heard of it. And he said, well, you should read it. So I get Myers's book, and Myers is a massage therapist who had access to cadavers. And he would use blunt dissection and started dissecting the fascia and discovered that it would go all the way from the toe to the head or all the way from your hands to the head and surround muscle a battery stacked one on top of each other, which is exactly what I had come to the conclusion we had to have in the body, but he'd already done the dissection. So I started with Myers's work. Now, unfortunately, he stopped at the neck and a lot of the stuff I was interested in, like the eye was obviously above the neck. So, but I started with his work and uh, I got uh, anatomy apps, uh, which fortunately allowed me to look at uh, if, if on an acupuncture 2D drawing, there's a line that goes from here to here, what muscle goes from here to here? And I could go to the app and figure that out. So what I was able to do was to develop a roadmap, an atlas, of the muscle battery packs and come to the conclusion that acupuncture meridians are simply stacks of muscle batteries surrounded by a common sheath or common stocking of, a, of fascia. And the other thing that had been reported is that fascia are simply semiconductors. So of course, you know better than I, a semiconductor is a collection of molecules that moves electrons uh, at the speed of light, but only in one direction. So that made a lot of sense. So then the fascia that we have surrounding our stacks of muscle batteries is simply the body's wiring system. So now we have a battery system, we have a wiring system. And uh, that helped me begin to understand why things that didn't seem to make sense actually made perfect sense. So for example, when I was sick, felt like somebody was sticking an, an ice pick in my left big toe my spleen was swollen and hurt. My stomach hurt all the time. Uh, I uh, lost the vision in my left eye, the macula of my left eye, and I couldn't think. Well, in, in any other form of medicine, you'd never put all those things together, but it turns out that, that everything I just described is on, has the same power supply. Duh. Right. <laughs> all of a sudden, things make perfect sense. And that same circuit goes through, guess what? This root canal tooth. So it became apparent that dead teeth in a circuit act like a circuit breaker and just shut the circuit off. Root canals should never be done. The dentists are the only physicians that think you can get away with leaving dead tissue in the body. No other doctor believes that. And that's what you do, a root canal, you drill a hole in the tooth, you reach in with an auger, turn it, rip out the artery, rip out the nerve and kill the tooth. Then you stuff it full of putty and assume that it's going to be stay sterile. Well, that's nonsense. It's still attached to the blood supply and lymphatics at the roots. So there's certainly roots uh, effort away for bacteria to get in there. And a root canal tooth is no different than having your big toe die. If you leave it there, you die of gangrene. Your appendix dies, you leave it there, you die of, pan of uh, peritonitis. A root canal, canal will kill you just as certainly, it just takes longer. So the fellow that popularized uh, root, uh, root canal procedure was a dentist named George Meinig. And Meinig spent the last years of his life trying to get dentists to quit doing them. He wrote this book called The Root Canal Cover-Up. And even before Meinig came, al came along and wrote his book, uh, Weston Price would take and 
pull teeth from somebody who was sick embedded under the skin of a rabbit. And within the week, the rabbit had the same illness as the person who owned the tooth. And he did that hundreds of times. And so the, the concept that dental infections cause systemic disease has been known a very long time, but the dentists have done a good job of trying to keep that covered up. There's actually a, uh, a popular uh, Netflix movie that's running right now called The Root Cause. And it, uh, this fellow catalogs his journey of being an athlete uh, uh, and then being disabled after he gets a root canal and then doing all this stuff, trying to get well, none of it works until he goes and gets rid of the root canal and then he's back healthy again, which is exactly what happened to me. Welcome to the Electricity of Life, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. In part one of this presentation, Dr. Jerry Tennant introduced us to his extraordinary research into the complex electrical circuitry of the human body. Since his own remarkable battle with debilitating ailments, Dr. Tennant has worked to develop a kind of map of this circuitry, illuminating its essential connection to physical well-being. In the previous episode, Dr. Tennant discussed the particular significance of the circuitry connecting teeth to other regions of the body. The concept of illness arising from electrical imbalances is of course unconventional in modern Western medicine. However, the application of electromagnetic therapies in healing is not new. In this conclusion, we asked Dr. Tennant to begin by discussing some of the earliest examples of the use of electromagnetism as a physical remedy. Well, interesting question. If you go back in time in the uh, 1800s and early 1900s, electromagnetic therapies of a variety of forms were commonplace. But that changed in about 1910 when uh, Andrew Carnegie and uh, John D. Rockefeller decided to become the major investors in the pharmaceutical industry. And so they had a report written called the Flexner Report, uh, which they then took to Congress. At that time, there were, I think, 13 homeopathic medical schools in this country. And again, most physicians were using some sort of electromagnetic uh, therapies. Well, the Flexner Report got Congress to forbid the use of any federal money for anyone to anyone who said there was energy in the body. So that closed the 13 homeopathic medical schools, and then any physician who was using an electro, electronic device to treat patients got put in jail. Well, that sent a pretty much of a chilling effect, and that's how our country stopped looking at energy in the body. Um, and that uh, was the case until uh, Nixon went to China, saw some of the people in his entourage uh, undergo surgery with acupuncture, and came back and told the NIH he wanted to be acupuncture to be part of uh, traditional medicine. But even though that was what the NIH was instructed to do, the, the people who control medicine in this country basically continued to ignore it. So, for example, many states, including my state of Texas, forbids the use of anything uh, that's not standard of care medicine. So what is standard of care medicine? Well, a group of physicians and insurance uh, people and so forth sit around a table and said, okay, if you make this diagnosis, you must treat it this way. And originally they said, these are going to be suggestions in order to improve the quality of care. But of course, that wasn't the plan. The plan was to make those the law. And so it has de facto become that. So if you go to a physician and the, the physician says you have this diagnosis and this diagnosis code, then the physician must treat you according to those guidelines. And if he doesn't, he loses his license and is considered guilty of malpractice de facto. So even if the physician knows that that's going to harm you, there's nothing to do about it. Even if the physician knows there's a better way to treat you, there's nothing to do about it. Even if 10 universities and medical schools have proven there's a better treatment. You can't, the physicians can't use that until that committee says that it's become standard of care. Most people don't know that. 
But what that does then is it puts the control of how medical care is delivered in this country in the hands of the small group of, of people who make up the rules of standard of care. And those are all slanted toward pharmaceutical, surgical uh, medicine, you see? So that's why people like me have to say, well, everything that I say is using my Arizona MDH license and not my Texas license because I'm not allowed in the state of Texas to tell you what I'm telling you. I have to use my Arizona license to do so. You know, medicine in this country is the most controlled, most supervised, most controlled business, if you please, of anything in the country. No other industry is more controlled than the practice of medicine. The effort to push it into things that work is constantly being suppressed, even to the place of physicians losing their livelihood in order to prevent that. Now, even though medical schools, most medical schools now have a division of integrative medicine where they teach this, it puts a physician in a very difficult position because a physician comes out of medical school knowing that that's a, a useful thing to do, but the state medical boards won't allow it. It's a very difficult thing. So what I have to do is I practice as a private expressive association. So the Supreme Court has, has had 72 different opinions given that says that legislators make laws to protect the public. But the people in a private group, like a church group, a sports group and so forth, are not the public. And that any private group may do anything they want to do as long as what they do is not a clear and present danger that rises to the level of a substantive evil. You may not have ever wondered why don't the police arrest boxers because it's against the law to go around slugging each other. Well, it's because boxing clubs are private expressive associations as defined by the U.S. Supreme Court. And so even though boxing is a clear and present danger, it does not rise to the level of a substantive evil. And so they don't get arrested. However, if religious people uh, sexually assault their parishioners, that does rise to the level of a substantive evil. And therefore, the police can go in and arrest a priest, a rabbi or whatever uh, for sexual abuse, you see. So, for example, that's the way I practice. So I don't practice. My practice isn't open to the public in the sense that if you want to come see me, you must join my practice private expressive association to become a member of my group. And then I can tell you what's in the medical literature rather than have to treat you with standard of care. If the health of living cells is governed by voltage, then an obvious concern in modern society is the rapidly growing pervasiveness of wireless technologies. We asked Dr. Tennant to identify some of the greatest obstacles we should be aware of today. Well, there's no doubt that we have all sorts of things that uh, that affect us. You know, for example, if I had you hold your arm straight out and check, push down on it, you would be strong. And then if I had you take a wristwatch with a battery in it and hold it right up against your chest and I pushed on your arm, you would go weak. So again, when we put electromagnetic energy within our, magnet, our personal magnetic field, it weakens us. Our particular frequencies weaken us. And so we're being bombarded with that sort of thing all the time. Here's the bottom line of the whole thing. We are constantly wearing ourselves out. So you get new cells in the macula of your eye every 48 hours. The lining of your guts replaced every three days. The skin you're sitting in today is six weeks old. Your liver's eight weeks old and your nervous system eight months old. So as cells wear out, you have to make new ones. Or if the cells get damaged some way, you have to make new ones. So chronic disease only occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells at work. Let me say that one more time. Chronic disease only occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells at work, which leads one to the question, well, what's it take to make a new cell that works? Well, first of all, where cells run at minus 25 millivolts of energy, it takes minus 50 millivolts to make a new cell. So you have to have the voltage. Then you have to have all the parts it takes to make a cell. You know, if a tornado blows your house down, you can't build a house back with doorknobs and bathroom tiles. You have to have everything it takes to make a house. 
And that's one of the big mistakes people make when they say, well, I'm trying to get well. And you say, well, take this stuff. They come back later and you say, well, you're still taking all this stuff. No, I just wanted to know what thing, what one thing worked. So I've just been taking one thing at a time. Well, nothing works. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Again, that concept of I want to know what works won't work because you have to have everything it takes to make a cell. And that's the nutrition piece, of course. So we have to have 50 millivolts of, of energy. We have to have all the parts it takes to make a cell. And we have to get rid of any toxins that damage cells as fast as you make them. So if you don't do all three of those things, you, you won't get well. One then goes in and looks at each of those. So for example, the voltage piece, we're able to measure the voltages in the circuits using something similar to the Nakatani or Roll uh, methodology. But one of the important things to understand is that it's well known in, in battery technology that if you take a rechargeable battery and you drain it all the way to zero, it'll flip itself upside down, flips a polarity. Well, if you take a battery upside down, put it in a battery charger, it won't take a charge, of course. So what we do is we go through and we can measure the polarity of every circuit in your body and figure out which ones are upside down. And those are the ones where you're going to be sick because you don't have juice. And those circuits are trying to borrow voltage from the next door neighbors. But I like to say the neighbors will give you a cup of sugar now and then, but they won't give you three meals a day. There are two kinds of energy in the universe of, that I'm aware of, electromagnetic and then scalar. And of course, scalar has the ability to reverse the polarity back to normal. So we have a device that will do that called a biotransducer. And we simply uh, can put it on um, one of the acupuncture spots in the body and all your batteries get turned back up. Of course, they're still discharged. Then we take the biomodulator, which puts out a specific waveform and recharge your batteries back up. Now your battery has power again. And then the body never forgets how to repair itself. Just that it has to have the power to do it, has to have the materials to do it. So no matter what's wrong with you, again, you ask me about neurology, uh, nephrology, cardiology, any of the ologies, you treat them all the same way because they're all sick for the same reason. They lost the ability to make new cells at work or, and or they lost the power to run. You can't have a heart that works if it's trying to run on 5 millivolts instead of 25 millivolts, right? You can't have a, a macula in your eye that works. All macular degeneration is because you've lost power in the stomach circuit, which is the power, the stomach circuit is acupuncture circuits, the power supply to the macula. So anytime somebody has macular degeneration you will, and you measure it, you always find there's no, there's inadequate power and it's reversed the polarity in the stomach circuit. Whereas glaucoma, the optic nerves on a different circuit, it's on the liver circuit. And so everybody, every time you see a glaucoma patient and measure it, the liver circuit will have flipped its polarity. So how do you treat it? You flip the polarity back, you charge the battery back up, and then you figure out why did the battery lose its charge in the first place? Well, there are five basic reasons. One is that you have to look at thyroid hormone because thyroid controls the voltage of every cell membrane in the body. T3 controls uh, the voltage of the cell membranes and the number of mitochondria. T2 controls the function of the mitochondria. So you always, let's say you don't have enough thyroid hormone, your battery discharges to here. Now, if you put a scar across one of your circuits and it touches the fascia, it shorts it out like any other electronic short. So wherever you have scars, that's going to short out that circuit. So many women have a, a C-section scar, which goes right across the stomach circuit. The spleen stomach circuit is the entire reproductive system, the entire endocrine system, the thinking part of the brain, the macula of the eye. Okay, so thyroid takes us down to here, scars take us down to here. Dental infections, since every circuit goes through specific teeth, if you have an infection in a tooth that acts like a resistor and drops the voltage. All right, dental infections takes you down to here. Emotions are stored in the body as magnetic fields, as I discussed in my lecture to the electric universe. And all of us have emotions, but if you have a wire and you put a magnetic field around it, blocks the flow of voltage. That's how emotions drop our voltage and make us sick. Thyroid, scars, dental infections, emotions, and finally toxins. And now your battery is drained to zero and flips upside down. And there you go, you're sick. One of the problems with American medicine 
is that the scientists say we have to isolate everything else and look at just this one thing to see if it's the cause of the disease. It almost never is. Almost all diseases are multifactorial. And that's why we have such a hard time in American medicine finding the cause because it's almost always several causes that flip the voltage. Then when you don't have voltage, as voltage drops, oxygen drops because the amount of oxygen that'll dissolve in a liquid is dictated by the voltage of the liquid. When you lose voltage, you lose oxygen. When you lose oxygen, your metabolism becomes inefficient, infections show up, and when you get to plus 30 millivolts, you have cancer. Simple as that. 